Okay, so welcome to cell transport. At least that's what we're going to be talking about during this little video presentation. Uh, we started this on Monday and we finished it up today, so I just wanted to make sure that I got this video out there. Uh, where we begin, uh, if you remember from class on that day that we first started this on Monday, what would happen to a factory if its power were shut off or its supply or materials never arrived, and then in addition, what would happen if the factory couldn't get rid of its garbage? Well, you could think about this for a little bit, and I actually want you to, so pause your video, take a few seconds, and think about this. Um, when we start to think about what would happen if we cut off the supply of materials to a factory, well, the answer is simple. The factory would cease to exist. It wouldn't work anymore. The product that the factory is trying to produce wouldn't be made. In, in the same sense, if we couldn't get rid of the garbage, all that garbage would just build up and it would eventually build up so much that it would get in the way of what product was trying to be made. So the factory essentially, if we couldn't bring in materials and we couldn't get rid of waste, it wouldn't function. And that's exactly what the cell membrane does. So like a factory, an organism must be able to obtain energy must be able to obtain nutrients, obtain energy, and it needs to be able to get rid of waste. And an organism cells perform all of these functions. Okay, so even in the, the picture over here, these are some of the different things that we're going to talk about, but the process of obtaining some of these nutrients across the cell membrane is what we're going to be discussing. I want you to think about all of these pictures. Again, pause the video, think about what these pictures have in common with each other. Okay, so these five pictures you can see we have a we have a club bouncer, we have the Great Wall of China, we have the turnpike toll booths, we have a cell, and we have students. And if you really think about it, all of these items are what we would call selectively permeable, meaning they decide what comes in and what goes out. The bouncer decides what comes in or what goes out of his club. The Great Wall of China at one point decided to keep uh, out the Mongols from invading the country of China. The turnpike toll booths allow certain people to pass or certain people to come back in, uh, depending upon the fee that they pay. Uh, the students kind of control what knowledge they allow themselves to obtain. You know, so there's some days in, in class that you guys just let one thing in the ear and out the other end and you don't end up, you know, really obtaining anything. And that is a choice. You're selectively permeable at some points and so are cells, okay? It is the exchange between materials or exchange of materials between a cell and its environment. This takes place at the cell membrane. To understand how materials move into and out of the cell, we need to understand and know about uh, our first form of transportation, which is diffusion. And diffusion is the movement from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Okay, High concentration being crowded, low concentration being less crowded. If you take a look at the um, animation, over here you can see it starts out very concentrated, very crowded, and over time what you have is they spread out. These molecules, we did a demonstration in class that had showed what happens when I put a drop of food coloring into a beaker full of water. And that food coloring starts out very, very concentrated, just like this animation. The red dots start out very concentrated, very close together, and over time they spread out to where they are evenly distributed amongst the entire um, black box, or in the case of our beaker and food coloring, they spread out to where they are completely distributed, evenly distributed throughout the entire beaker. And something, a big note to take here is that this takes absolutely no energy to occur. I don't sit there and apply any sort of energy to it. I'm not stirring the beaker, the food coloring. I'm not stirring any of that. I'm not adding any energy. It would occur on its own. Specifically, the cells of organisms are surrounded by and filled with fluids that are made mostly of 
water. Big surprise there. The diffusion of water through the cell membrane is known as osmosis. Okay, so that term is osmosis. This takes no energy to occur. So it's the exact same thing as diffusion. It, it's, it, it's exactly the same. It is diffusion, but this time it's just diffusion of water. Okay, so what we're looking at here is we have um, osmosis. We have a diagram here that's explaining osmosis. You can see that we have the selectively permeable membrane put right down the middle. And what they've done is they have water on both sides, but they have added what we would call a solute. They have added sugar molecules and then a little bit more on the left side of our beaker than on the right side. So if we go back to this diagram, it explains three forms here called hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. Okay, hypertonic means that the concentration of solutes outside of the cell is greater than on the inside. So water is going to flow out of the cell. On the, on the hypotonic, the concentration of solutes is greater on the inside, so solutes are going to flow into the cell. Okay, so if we take a look back at our diagram, the concentration of solutes is greater on this side, so therefore more water is going to flow over to this side. If we were to give you an example of red blood cells, okay, they're surrounded by plasma. Plasma is made up of water, salt, sugar, as well as some other particles. And there's a very delicate balance that must be maintained, and it's actually maintained by your kidneys and osmosis. Okay, if red blood cells were put in pure water, okay, and this pure water is actually in this middle column right here, water molecules would flood the cell. So if you were to put a blood cell into pure water, you are going to have just massive amounts of water come into the cell because the concentration of solutes is greater on the inside of the cell, so water is going to flow into the cell. When red blood cells are put into a salty solution, okay, this last one over here, the diff this, or they are going to now flow out of the cell. So water will now go towards the solutes, towards our salt solution, okay, and into the solution out of the cell, leaving it very shrunken and shriveled up. What we have here is called an isotonic solution, which means that the concentration of solutes is equal to on the outside as it is on the inside. I'm going to introduce a couple of new terms here. We have passive and we have active transport. Small particles travel through channels in the cell membrane. Channels meaning just a place, like a little path, um, some sort of passage for particles to pass through the cell membrane, and they do this by either passive or active transport. The movement of particles across the cell membrane without the use of energy by the cell, again, without the use of energy, is what we would call passive transport. Now, we've already talked about a couple of examples of these. We've talked about diffusion, and we've talked about osmosis. Now, we know that the diffusion always occurs when a particle is going from high concentration to low concentration. So that food coloring, it starts out really concentrated in the middle, or at that drop, and then as time goes on, it spreads out to a low concentration. On the opposite, a process of transporting particles that requires the cell to use energy is called active transport. Okay, you can see down here we have passive transport because our particles are very concentrated over here and they are simply going through one of those channel proteins, one of those channels in the cell membrane, to lower concentration. That makes perfect sense. Over here, active transport, what you're doing is we are taking something from low concentration and adding more to the high concentration, which is completely different from everything else we've talked about. This goes against everything that we've learned so far that things move from high concentration to low concentration. This moves from low to high. Now the difference here is right here. ATP, or energy. This only can happen if you are to add energy. And that energy is enough energy to be able to open up one of these proteins to allow something to go from low concentration to high concentration. 
Okay, I hope this helped. Um, even if you were in class and you just need a little bit of review, hopefully this helps and go through it. Uh, I will also want you to make sure that you watch the Amoeba Sisters video because that goes into a little bit more on hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. And then I'm also going to post a video from uh, the Crash Course series of videos which talks which will talk a lot about active and passive transport and hypertonic and hypotonic so lots of review available on blended schools all right hope this helped guys